Well, welcome. It is a joy to be here to teach on the life and legacy of Naomi from the Book of Ruth. This is actually not the first time I have taught the Book of Ruth. About 14 years ago, I did a weekend conference for high school and college age women on Ruth. I essentially taught a dating conference. I, I highlighted, you know, the, the, the kind of woman we want to be emulating Ruth and the type of character traits we wanted to find in a man like Boaz. I, I ended on this high note of, 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 you know, redemption and marriage and conception. And now you have to understand, I was 20, I was freshly engaged to my Boaz, and I, you, you know, I was uh, an expert, right, on all things the Book of Ruth. And so I teach this conference in a women league, just going out charged to find their Boaz. I mean, it was dangerous. I sent these young women out into the world, and I don't know what the world had in store for them, but they were, they were ready to find their Boaz. And when I got done, I was like, man, what a home run. <laughs> well, about 14 years later, many of which have been accompanied by severe suffering, as Phyllis has mentioned, I realize I miss a critical piece, if not the critical piece of the story. Naomi. Where was Naomi and all my googly and I advice on dating? I mean, I keep thinking, Whitney, surely you hit on her. She's the central character in the book. It's her crisis. It's her pain that drives the, the whole narrative, narrative from the prologue to the epilogue. And yet, the honest to goodness truth is I don't remember talking about her. And by missing her and her story of loss and pain and redemption, I did a severe injustice to the book of Ruth. But it's one that is more common than not. In all our excitement about the romance between Ruth and Boaz, it is easy to miss one hurting, lonely widow and her story of redemption. And so today I have a chance to redeem myself by bringing you the story of Naomi. We're going to go on a journey of grief and of hope with Naomi. And as we do, I want you to be thinking about where you find yourself in Naomi's story. What pieces of her story resonates with you? And we're going to move through this as a story because that's what it is. We're not going to cover the whole book. I'm going to skip over several chapters. You can read the book in full in about 15 minutes. I encourage you to do so. But since we're going through it as a story, I want to show you the structure of the story so you understand how it flows before we jump in. First of all, um, you're gonna, we're going to see in the prologue that Naomi is empty and destitute. Then we're going to see Act 1 that she's returning in lament, Act 2 that she's receiving in need, Act 3 that she's risking in hope, Act 4 that she's remaining in trust, and then we're going to make it to the epilogue where she is redeemed and renewed. And it's going to be a beautiful experience. So without further ado, turn with me to Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. The narrator begins, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Now pause there with me. When it says the time of the judges, the narrator is giving us some historical and spiritual context to this passage. This was a time of rampant immorality in Israel's history. It was one of the darkest periods, actually, in Israel's history. There was idolatry and sin and murder and rape. It was a horrific period. And, and there's a famine in the land. What's, what's the land? That's the promised land, the place of God's presence and people. It was supposed to be the place of blessing, and yet there's a famine in Bethlehem, which literally means house of bread. A little bit of irony there. Why is there a famine there? Well, because God has sent a famine as one of the covenant curses to draw Israel back. It was a mercy to draw them back in individual and national repentance. That's what they were supposed to do. And yet instead, do we see them doing that? No, we see a family leaving the land. Pick it up in verse 2. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the name of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Epaphrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab, which was a pagan nation who served the pagan god 
Kinosh and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. She was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives, the name of one was Orba, the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about ten years. Notice what didn't happen, no children. And both Mahon and Kilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and husband. Ladies, here in five short verses, we witness the total decimation of one woman's life. She leaves Moab to be filled, and she leaves Bethlehem to be filled, and ends up in Moab completely empty. She, she is now in a foreign land, away from the presence of God and God's people. She has no husbands or sons to protect or provide for her. And she has no heir to carry on the family name. This family is now tearing on an extinction. This is, you have to understand, this is the worst fate for a woman in ancient patriarchal culture. A, a, a mother's life was bound up in the home. In her sons, the sons would actually stay in the home. They would marry, but stay in the home and live with the mothers and take care of them into their old age. So there was always protection and provision. But Naomi now has no sons to take care of her, no husband to care for her. She is empty and destitute in every conceivable way. She has entered, and this is what we have to understand, she has entered with her sons dying. She has entered into a living death. It is as if she herself has died. She, her life is functionally over. And if you have ever experienced deep, sustained suffering, you know at this point that death would have been a relief. It would have been a relief. And we can't allow familiarity with Naomi's story to numb us to, to the weight of her grief. Reading narrative material well means entering into the story, entering into the characters' lives, and, and taking on their pain and their sorrow. We need to realize that Naomi was a real woman with real pain. You know, I will never forget when Naomi's pain became real to me. I was studying her life several years ago as I attended my grandpa's funeral. And it just so happened where I was standing, an image became burned into my mind. At an angle, I could see my grandma right there in the front row, tired and hurting and frail, hunched over the American flag folded on her lap. But just beyond her, I could see three tombstones. One, the first one, of her daughter-in-law, who died tragically giving birth to a son. The second, her son, who died tragically falling from a commercial building in a freak accident with construction. And then the third, her other son, who died tragically in a car accident almost four months to the day after she had buried her other son. And in that moment, I realized Naomi's pain was real. It was as real as your pain and my pain. And Naomi's story invites you to reflect on tragedy and pain and loss, hers and yours and others. You know, maybe you haven't experienced a tragedy like Naomi or like my grandma, but I know in the last two years alone, you've experienced a pandemic, Wildfires, relocation, isolation, constant stress, constant changes, loss of normalcy, loss of relationships, broken and fragmented relationships over all the craziness of COVID. This has been a devastating season for all of us. Devastating. You know, I always say that there is there is more than one kind of death in this life. Life in a broken world, there are, there are many ways. There are many kind of deaths in a broken world, and we grieve all of them. And if there is room in God's story for Naomi and her pain, there is room in God's story for you and your pain. 
So ladies, I want you to ask yourself today, how do you identify with Naomi? What, what tragedy or pain or loss are you experiencing? And what, what emotions and pain and doubts and questions have come to the surface in the midst of that? We're going to do something today that's very unnatural for modern Westerners. We're going to let all of that come to the surface and we're going to face the pain. I know we would rather do anything but face the pain. We would rather busy ourselves. We would rather numb ourselves with Netflix or chocolate. We would rather um, work ourselves, you know, to the bone than actually have to sit and face our pain. But true healing cannot begin until you face the pain. So today, ladies, we need to face the pain. Grief experts agree that a person is truly on their way to becoming well when she begins to face her pain. That's the starting point for healing. We need to stop all the craziness and let it come to the surface and just face the fact that we're not okay. Like Phyllis said, we're not okay. And today it's okay to not be okay. And as we allow that pain to come to the surface, we're going to see how Naomi responds to her pain. In order to show us how we might respond to ours, we see in Act 1 that she's returning in lament. Returning in lament. In verse 6 it says she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. Just pause there. Do you see either on the screen or in your biblical text that Lord is in all caps? Anytime Lord is in all capital letters in the Old Testament, that is that means Yahweh. It's God's personal, relational, covenantal name that he gave himself to his people in the Exodus. And that's going to be important to remember. Naomi's covenantal God had intervened to provide food. And what does she do? It says, so she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to return, and notice that word again, to the land of Judah. Now this term return seen twice in this passage is actually a Hebrew word used 12 times in our passage in chapter 1. And it carries with it the idea of repentance. This isn't just returning, me go driving home, returning from Washington today to, to Portland, Oregon. No, no, no. This is a move of repentance. And so although the move to Moab was likely a limitless decision in a patriarchal culture in his sin, Naomi, when she gets a word from God, she still needs to return or repent by getting back to the place where she knows she needs to be. It's the place of God's presence and God's people. And so she sets off. And the text tells us that somewhere along the way, she, where she's like, hold up, hold up, hold up. You girls, you can't come with me. you got to go back to Moab. I'm as good as dead. The Lord's hand has gone out from me. I have nothing to offer you. No husbands, no sons. Leave me. Leave me. I'm cursed. You might still have a chance for life. And Orpah eventually leaves, but it says that Ruth clings to her. Ruth is adamant. She binds herself to Naomi and Naomi's God. And this is Ruth's conversion, the climactic moment of Act 1. It's not only her conversion, but we're going to find out that Ruth is the very means by which God is going to save and redeem Naomi. And so they head back to Bethlehem, and they enter the city gates. And the, and the Bible says, the, the passage says, that the whole town is stirred because of them. And they ask, is this Naomi? Now, for some reason, in those 10 years, she's become unrecognizable. It may be that grief has so changed and marred her appearance that she looks so tired and haggard and worn out that she's unrecognizable. Now, a lot of us understand this with the pandemic, right? Post-pandemic, we saw each other and was like, I was like, hey, girl, I'm looking a little hood rat, okay? Uh, I've been plucking and pulling my grays, but this girl needs a makeover. She needs a hair dye. She needs to put some real pants on. Okay, when we saw each other after the pandemic, some of us had age. I had age. And so it could have been that, that she was just unrecognizable from the pain. Or it might have been they were so used to seeing her with Maimon, Kilion, and Elimelech. And now she has no men in her life and a foreign widow by her side. But for whatever reason, they are stirred. But in all the commotion, she does something so interesting right now. She silenced them 
with a lament. She, she pours out this raw, uncensored lament before God's people. And it makes modern readers a little bit uncomfortable, this idea of lament. But I want us to break this down here because there's a lot going on right beneath the surface. You know, until more recent scholarship, Naomi's got a bad rap. She seems that bitter old hag, right? Weighing down Ruth and Boaz, you know. She's seen as the one we kind of want to put in the corner to this beautiful romantic story. Or, or she's been conveyed as sinful in her anger and bitterness. But her lament is incredibly complex. I have it on the ESV, the actual print on the ESV on this slide, but I want to read it to you in a personal paraphrase. Remember that Lord is her relational covenantal God. That's God's name, Yahweh. It's his relational name. And Almighty is Shaddai. It's, it carried with it God's all-powerful cosmic rule. So putting together the Lord and Almighty stresses God's relational nature and cosmic rule. And Naomi says this, do not call me pleasant. Call me bitter. For the all-powerful one who rules the world has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and my covenantal God has brought me back empty. Why call me pleasant when my covenantal God has testified against me, and the all-powerful one who rules the world has brought this calamity upon me? Now, her judgment of God's goodness is definitely clouded in her pain and bitterness. But look at where she's at and what she's doing. She has drug herself back to the place of God's presence. She is hurting. She is tired. She is raw. She is weary. Her story is unresolved. And yet in all of that, she drug herself back to where God was. And look at what she's doing. She's pouring out her pain to God's people. She's not denying her God. She's saying, this is my covenantal God. And she's affirming his sovereign rule over all things, even if it seems mysterious and unjust to her. Ladies, I would like to posit that this is one of the more faithful acts of obedience that we see in the scriptures. She is a wreck, but she is a wreck in the place where she knows she needs to be. She is a wreck, but she is pouring out her pain to God's people. Uh, rather than being seen as sinful, we need to see her return and lament as an act of faithful obedience. Are you getting me? Faithful obedience. You know, it is so easy to withdraw relationally, emotionally, spiritually, physically in our pain. And I know that because I'm hurting too. I know intimately the desire to retreat in my pain. But here Naomi serves as a living illustration and application of what we're supposed to do in our pain and our loss and our disenchantment and disappointment. We're to run back to the place where we know God is and where we know God's people are. Now listen, I'm not making a one-to-one -one application. And Naomi lived under the Old Covenant, where God's presence was actually tied to a geographic location, uh, and God's people were supposed to live in the Promised Land. Today, under the New Covenant, we live in a time where through the work of Jesus, God's presence indwells us through the indwelling Holy Spirit. We praise God for that. And yet we know, we know that God is always at work in the local church. And God's people are always at in fellowship together in the local church. Some of us today, our response needs to be in our pain and hurt it. We need to run back to the local church, the place where we can worship God and hear that gospel message preached that we need to hear and take of the sacraments and fellowship with one another and then be on mission with Jesus. Some of us need to get back to the place we know we need to be. And like Naomi, ladies, we cannot wait until the situation is perfect. We cannot 
wait until our stories are resolved, until our pain is gone, until the mass mandates are lifted. Amen. Amen. We've got to get back to the place where God's working. And, and like Naomi, we go as we are. We go as we are. This is where the lament is so key. This is where the lament is so key. A lament is, is a prayer or a complaint directed towards God that expresses sorrow and grief. And it's found all over the Bible. There's lament all over the Bible. It allows us, lament allows us to fully face and name the pain without, uh, and, 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 well, and it makes space for future hope and resolution without glossing over our current trauma. It lets us ask the hard questions without condemnation. Did you hear that? It lets us ask hard questions without condemnation. It lets us vent and plead and cry. It lets us say, God, why did my child die? Why did my spouse leave? Why did I lose that job when you knew we were in financial crisis? Why am I battling mental illness again? God, why, where are you in the midst of this? And it's raw and it's messy, but ladies, it's biblical. God wants to hear your pain. You can use Psalms, you can do this individually and corporately using Psalms like Psalm 13 or Psalm 142. I'll give you those on loan. Those have been my two favorite songs of lament that I've lamented in the past six years. 13 and 142. You can lament a moment, you can also, this week, even this week, you can grab some girlfriends, some close friends, and say, listen, let's get together and take an hour and just cry out to God. Let's name our pain. Let's lament together. You, you Maybe you need to add a prayer of lament to your ministry or, or, or your, um, your home and your families or maybe in, in corporate worship. We've added lament into our corporate worship and it has changed the game. You know why? It has created space for sufferers to not be okay, to still attend church and to not be okay in the church. And in the church, we need to start making space for people to not be okay. That's the safest place someone should feel. And if that's not the case, then something's wrong. So we return to God's presence and God's people, and we lament and we grieve. And as we do, we see that we're also going to need some help. That's, that's act two there. We need some help. Naomi's receiving in need, receiving in need. I'm picking up the story in chapter two, verse one. It says, now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And, the, and Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to glean uh, the field among the heirs of, ears of grain after him and whose sight I shall find favor. And all she says is, go, my daughter. At this point, Naomi's toasted. Like so many of us, she is weary, she is tired, she is hurting. She's hurting in the right place, but she's likely depressed. I infer that from the text because she doesn't offer to go and help Ruth glean something that would have been incredibly dangerous for a widowed foreigner. She, had, she shows no concern for Ruth's welfare or even for her own welfare. She just says, go, my daughter. So, so Naomi needs help. That's what she needs right now. She can't do anything herself. She needs help. And that's exactly what happens. Ruth jumps into action, takes center stage in chapter 2. She goes into the field, happens to end up in Boaz's field. The narrators with a wink and nod is showing us it's no happenstance at all. Yahweh, the Lord, is at work in this story. And so she happens to end up in the field just in time to meet Boaz. And he, takes, he shows her favor, immediately takes to her. Gives her tons of grain, gives her a meal, invites her in for a family meal, gives her a meal, sends her home with leftovers. She comes home to Naomi with this huge bag of grain, more than she could have ever gleaned without the favor of Boaz, and with leftovers for a meal. And Naomi's like, what the heck happened? She says, whose field did you glean it? And Ruth said, I don't know. It was this guy, this guy named Boaz. And for the first time in the story, Naomi comes alive with hope. She says, blessed be the Lord who has, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or dead. She said, this man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. This means that he could 
step in and buy the property they were going to have to sell and he could farm it and give them the proceeds so that they could live off that um, until they died and have livelihood. This was an incredible and important role in the ancient Israelite culture, the Redeemer. And Naomi, who's been depressed and listless and exhausted, comes alive with hope through the help of Ruth and Boaz. Listen, it's hard to receive help. I would rather help than be helped. I would rather give and give and give than be seen as weak and needy. Am I alone or is anyone following me here? Preach it, I know. But if crime, you know, it's interesting because we live in a culture that exalts the individualistic, rugged individualism. We exalt the Lone Ranger, even if the Lone Ranger is tired and weary and depressed and confused and alone. It's madness. It's madness. If chronic disease has taught me anything, it's taught me that I'm incredibly needy. The only reason I'm standing up here today is because a whole community came around me and got me ready for this event. People came into my house and cleaned. People dropped off meals. People sent me money so I could get IVs to get nutrients to be able to stand up here. People folded my laundry. People prayed over me. I have people all over the nation praying for me right now. I have received so much help. The truth of the matter is, is uh, over the course of six years of disease and a whole lot of ongoing therapy, it's true, I have come to this, accept the fact that I am weak and needy. I'm not the keynote speaker who's up here to slay it. No, I am the weakest woman in the room, and I know it. I need help. Ladies, the application is pretty straightforward, but you might not like it. You have to receive help when you're in need. You have to receive help. Maybe you grew up, you know, in a tumultuous home where there just wasn't space for your needs and you were taught that needs were bad. Or maybe you, you were grew up in a Christian home and yet you were taught that being good and godly meant that you, you were always giving and never receiving. The true spirituality meant you never had any needs. Uh, I just want you to know that's an anti-gospel. That's anti-gospel. You know the gospel, right? The gospel that tells us we are all weak. And needy. Like Naomi, we were dead in our sins and our trespasses. We were helpless to do anything about it. And just when we couldn't go on, God intervened with provision. Just like in the story of Naomi. He intervened with provision through the sinless sacrifice of his son. Jesus lived the perfect life we couldn't live. He died the death we should have died. And then he rose from the dead to offer us forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And all that the gospel requires is that you come weak and needy and faith and repentance to receive Jesus. If, if you don't know yourself to be a Christian today, that's the only application you need to run to Jesus in your need and to repent of your sin and turn your faith in him. But if you are a believer, ladies, it's high time we start receiving help. Ask yourself, what's keeping me from receiving help? And then let's think about a few ways to grow in this. First of all, you have to admit that you need help to yourself and to others. You have to admit you need help. It is okay to have needs. It's human and healthy and good to have needs. There are two categories. There is the creature who has needs and the creator who has no needs. Now, if you were to find yourself in one of those categories, what would it be? The last time I checked, none of us are the creator. So we have needs, and that's okay. You have to admit to yourself and others. And this really comes into play when we think about the local church, the place where we're all weak and needy, receiving the gospel and then helping each other. You know, many people have been disillusioned by the church amidst the pandemic. They felt like their needs haven't been met. And I am not saying the church is perfect, but today we're dealing with our response. And I would like to bring this up. I mean, maybe, maybe the church hasn't been able to help you because they don't know what your needs are. And this is where it gets a little, you know, a little bit stepping on toes, but maybe the church doesn't know your needs because they don't really know you. I mean, ask yourself, does anyone in your local church really know you and your needs? 
If not, that's your step this week. Get reconnected to someone and be known. Secondly, start small. Just start small. If you're not used to receiving help, you're probably not going to let some stranger come in and fold your underwear like I did this week, okay? <laughs> Took me six years to get there. <sighs> Talking about my underwear, I think that's funny. But <laughs> it took me six years to get there. But you could start small. You could start small. Just start by texting someone and say, I need prayer. People love to pray for you. Just say, I need prayer. And then maybe you graduate to receiving a meal. And then maybe you get to the point where you say, you text someone and say, listen, these kids are driving me insane. I'm going to need some F2F. It took me forever to figure out what that meant. Everyone keeps texting me about F2F, some face-to-face -face time. I need some face-to-face -face time. Would you go to a coffee shop and meet with me for an hour? Okay, so start small and work your way up there. And as you're thinking about all of this, I want to move us into this next, the next acts here. As I said, we're going to skip right over Act 3 and 4. You can read those chapters this week. All you need to know is that in Chapter 3, Naomi, freshly alive with hope, uh, revived through the help of Ruth and Boaz, decides to take a risk in securing a better future for her, sends Ruth to the threshing floor to propose marriage to Boaz. Uh, he offers to do everything he can to secure a uh, future for them. Chapter 3 ends with them remaining in trust. Ruth and Naomi are at home remaining in trust as Boaz heads to the city gates and deals shrewdly with the near kinsman redeemer. He goes all like Mr. Darcy on us. Do I have any Pride and Prejudice fans? Oh, who's not? He goes Mr. Darcy on us. He leaves no stone unturned as he secures redemption for Naomi, marriage for Ruth, and the ability through conception to perpetuate a Limelex family line. The town erupts, erupts in spontaneous celebration. Redemption, restoration, renewal. This is what we've been waiting for, which moves us. I mean, we've been in through so much loss, and then we finally migrate to the epilogue, where, where Naomi is redeemed and renewed. And I want us to look at the epilogue. It's so powerful. Look at chapter 4, verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. So here we see that God graciously provides a son as a result of their kindness. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, Naomi's covenant to God, who has not left you this day without a redeemer. May his name be renowned in Israel. So notice that it's the Lord who's been working behind all the humans' interaction, orchestrated to keep his promises, to redeem Naomi, to restore Naomi. This child shall be to you, he shall be to you, a restorer of life and nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child in uh, her lap and became his nanny. And the women of the neighborhood said, oh, get this. The women of the neighborhood said, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Here we see Naomi completely redeemed through the birth of the son Obed, who was going to be in the lineage of King David, uh, who would eventually be the father uh, uh, of, of the greater king, King Jesus. What was once a tragedy has been transformed into this amazing gospel story. And we understand gospel stories, don't we, on this side of the cross? We know that, that Jesus, our greater kinsman redeemer, has secured full redemption for us. So there's always hope, even in the midst of severe brokenness and darkness. But as we wait for Jesus' return, we partner with him on mission with a renewed vocation. Notice how merciful God is. He gives Naomi a renewed vocation, something to do in her latter years. She becomes a nanny to this little boy. Everything she has lost. Now she has purpose in her pain. God gives her something to take all that pain and to, and to do the nourish her, restore her. It doesn't mean that her losses aren't real. He doesn't replace her sons, but he gives her a fresh life. You know, I spoke earlier about my grandma. What I didn't mention is that when her daughter-in-law died giving birth, she had three children, including the baby. And my grandma took in all three and raised them as her own. And I was talking to my grandma recently, last week, and I was just 
talking through the pain and asking if I had permission to speak about her story, and I, I finally just said, Grandma, how did you do it? How did you keep going? And she said, just plain and simple, well, I had Samuel to take care of. I had Samuel to take care of. A baby, the provision of a baby gave her a renewed vocation that carried her through her darkest days. That baby's name, Sam, Samuel or Sam, he grew up and he is the one who led me to Christ. 18 years ago, and, and, and so much of my love for Jesus and my love for the Word and love for Jesus' people, so much of it can be traced back to the faithfulness of a woman who fulfilled her renewed vocation in her darkest days. Amen. Ladies, God has a purpose for your pain. God has a purpose for your pain. As we conclude, we need to remember that God is always at work in his story. And he's at work in your story to redeem your pain. He wants to bring a renewed vocation out of that suffering. So ask yourself, where do I see God redeeming my pain and suffering? And out of that redemption, what is he birthing? What new mission or purpose is he birthing in my heart? What new dream is he giving you? What new ministry is he at calling you to? Maybe a ministry you would have never dreamed about before had you not gone through this particular pain. What renewed vocation is God asking you to do? Ladies, he's so gracious to us that not only does he redeem us, but he calls us into something greater. Our pain can be used for his purposes. It not only helps us, it helps others and serves to advance the gospel. So, so just know that it doesn't replace your losses. But pain in the hands of a loving God can transform your life and in turn transform the lives of others. As we close, I want you to think about all we've looked at in Naomi's life. And I want you to ask, what is the Spirit individually pressing on your heart today? What takeaway from Naomi's story do you need to take home with you? And as you reflect on that individual response, we're going to do something unique, something we haven't done in the Bible before. We're going to respond corporately in a prayer of lament. You know, we ended on this high note of redemption, but some of us aren't there yet. I'm not there yet. I'm stuck in chapters one and two. Pain has a way of walling you in and creating a cycle that you can't break, but lament, it breaks that cycle of pain because it gets you into God's presence, it gets you among God's people, and it gets you talking about the pain. So today, we're going to run to God's presence and we're going to talk about the pain. So would you all pray with me? Lord, with our voices, we cry out to you, our covenantal God who rules the world. Lord, we turn to you because we have nowhere else to turn. And with our voices, we plead for mercy, asking that you would hear our cries. Lord, right now, we ask that you would not hide your face from us. God, we pour out our complaints to you. We tell you our troubles. We've been so burdened by the pandemic and everything that has come with it. Lord, we've battled so much isolation and fear and anxiety and depression. God, we've been sad and weary and confused. God, we've battled sickness and division and chronic stress. God, you know our hearts. You know we hate these things. We hate this suffering in a broken world. How long, God? How long are you going to let us experience this? How long until you bring resolution to our stories? God, we also grieve the enormous losses that have accompanied the last several years. And we want to name those losses, Lord, in your face. We want to bring them to you so you can attend to our pain. God, we grieve the loss of connection, of fellowship, of normalcy, the loss of routine, of corporate worship, of coffee and play dates, of visitors, simple things like wedding showers and baby showers. God, we, we grieve the loss of close relationships over things like masks and vaccine and COVID protocols. We mourn the loss of any sense of relief, the mounting pressure, God. We feel it every day, the tension. When will you break the tension, Lord? We grieve the loss of jobs, 
of school routines, of ministry opportunities, of passion projects. God, we grieve the loss of life, the death of loved ones, and Lord, we grieve that we weren't even able to say goodbye in person to some of our loved ones. Apart from you, these losses seek to overwhelm us. But now, God, we ask boldly that you would not only hear our lament, but you would intervene to do something about it. Bring us out of this season that feels so endless. Bring healing and hope to individual lives. Bring healing and hope to every single story in this room. Bring healing to churches and to the nations. Bring an end to this pandemic and begin to restore what has been lost. We pray you restore normalcy, heal divisions and wounds and relationships. God, would you allow us to meet in fellowship without fear? God, we pray that you would bring relief that you would send hope and healing and redemption. And as we wait, Lord, for that hope and healing, we choose to trust you. Lord, we do not understand. Like Naomi, we do not understand your mysterious ways. We don't understand everything you're doing. But we believe you are working for our good. We believe that you have always and will continue to deal generously with us. We know this because of the cross of Christ. Lord, at the cross, you proved that you will always deal with us generously. It proves your love, your goodness, and your kindness. We know it because Jesus died for us. So in the midst of the raging storm, we affirm that you are our refuge. You are our shelter, and you are our portion and the land of the living. And God, despite what we're feeling and despite our circumstances, we choose to trust you. We choose to trust you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.